All right, Council Member, I believe we are now live streaming. Okay, well, thank you, Erin, and welcome everyone to the very first meeting of the Climate and Sustainability Committee. This is really exciting, and I'm excited about the work that uh, we will be uh, doing on this particular panel. So, Erin, let's go ahead and start with roll call. Chair Moreno, present. Council Member Harris, present. Council Member Thomas, present. Council Member Morell. Council Member Green. We have three members, we have a quorum. Thank you so much, Erin, appreciate it. Uh, as as uh, the, the viewing public can see, we are conducting virtual meetings at this time uh, due to the uptick of the Omicron variant. And so when we conduct virtual meetings, what we do is we uh, first begin the meeting, then we'll read the entire agenda, and then we're gonna pause for a few minutes to accept public comment on the agenda. Public comment is submitted online at council.nola.gov. So what I'll do now is turn it over to Aaron to read the agenda, and then we'll take a 10 minute recess to accept public comment and we will get the agenda started after that. Aaron? Good morning all. Climate and Sustainability Committee, Wednesday, January 19th, 2020, 9.30 a.m. Agenda. Item one, roll call. Item two, committee overview presentation. The committee will present an overview of the committee's scope and goals. Item three, electric vehicles presentation. The committee will receive presentations on the benefits of investing in electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. Sub, sub item A, electric fleet and Louisiana adoption to present Louisiana Clean Fuels and RPC. Tom Hazley, AICP, Principal Engineer, Regional Planning Commission. Sub item B, charge point to present Justin Ackley, Public Policy and Re Regulatory Manager, charge point. Item four, resolution R2211. The committee will consider a resolution encouraging the city and the sewage and water board to take steps toward utilizing 100% renewable power to meet their energy needs. Item five, ordinance number 33,592. The committee will consider an ordinance to transition the city fleet to zero emission vehicles. Item six, adjournment. That is the agenda. Thank you, Aaron. So let's take a quick 10 minute recess. If you'd like to submit public comment on any of these items, the council website is council.nola.gov. So Aaron, let's see, it is 9.33. We will be back at 9.43.
Hey, Council Member Morrell. I'm here. We'll just wait on Aaron to, to bring us back. Hey there. Hey, Aaron. All right, it's 943. Aaron, can you do roll call again? And we, we will um, reestablish our quorum and get started. Sure. Chair Moreno, present. Councilmember Morell, present. Councilmember Harris, present. Councilmember Thomas, present. We have four members. We have a quorum. Thank you so much, Aaron. Appreciate it. So once again, as I mentioned earlier, welcome to the first meeting of the Climate and Sustainability Committee. I am really uh, proud and excited about the work that we're going to be able to do on this committee because at the end of the day, the city of New Orleans, we know it, we must work harder to embrace the necessary urgency of climate action and lead our transition to a clean economy of our future. Due to the severity of climate impacts of our city, in our city, and we've seen some of those most recently with Hurricane Ida, we must take significant action now. Storms are coming out of so much faster and they're stronger. We can't afford to make excuses of why we can't meet clean energy and climate goals, goals, but instead we need to find a way to get to yes. In New Orleans, we have a great advantage toward harnessing renewable and clean energy because of our authority to regulate Energy New Orleans. The City Council led in creating the South's first renewable clean portfolio standard. We call it RCPS. RCPS ends carbon emissions from Energy New Orleans power generation by 2050. Today, we will continue with that progress by cleaning up our own house. And what I mean by that is that we will consider strong major efforts to reshape city government's climate profile by transitioning to 100% to a 100% clean fleet and 100% and clean power for municipal facilities. Numerous other cities across the country have adopted these types of initiatives. In New Orleans, we must do the same. Today, we have presenters who will walk us through the importance of both proposals and also receive a presentation about electrical, electric vehicle infrastructure, along with the benefits of implementation. Through our recent rate case, Energy New Orleans has begun planning and also planning on deployment of EV infrastructure, along with incentives and opportunities for businesses to also bring the infrastructure to their properties. And we look forward to a presentation on that at a later meeting. But for now, let us begin with today's agenda. The first item, a presentation by Aaron Spears, who is our Council of Utility Regulatory Office uh, Director, along with my Chief of Staff, Andrew Tuazolo, to talk about this new committee and the work that we are poised to do and to accomplish. So I'll turn it over to either uh, Andrew or to Aaron to get us started. Sure. Thank you, Council President, and uh, good morning, members. And uh, thank you, guests, for offering uh, your information today. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to briefly run through this, and then Aaron's going to clean up uh, my mistakes. Um, so, uh, early or late last year, Council President Moreno um, proposed, and the full council passed a uh, change to our standing committees, creating this committee with a uh, singular focus on uh, climate action here in the city of New Orleans. That also retains regulatory authorities. Um, but has expanded uh, its policy portfolio into a full spectrum look at how we can attack uh, climate change uh, th through the levers of policy, but also through uh, stakeholder engagement and uh, our ability to uh, bring people to the table and work collaboratively with the community. So um, as we all know, um, there needs to be an urgency and a focus on, on climate action and environmental justice here in New Orleans. Um, obviously, the, the threat to our city and state is very real. We know it in 
every summer that is warmer and wetter, every winter that is more severe, every uh, tropical storm that is stronger and faster, and the dis uh, disproportionate impacts that makes on our underserved communities. So this is an issue not just of um, safety and of uh, economy, but it's also an issue that we must make sure that we are always uh, seeking justice through these efforts as well. Uh, I wanted to point out that <clears throat> the Governor Edwards um, has coordinated a climate uh, action committee, a statewide committee to create a plan for Louisiana to uh, change its uh, climate profile to end uh, carbon emissions here in Louisiana. Um, that a report that was uh, a draft report that was issued just last month indicated that Louisiana is among the most vulnerable states in the United States, the impacts of climate change. Uh, it's a significant uh, um, problem that Louisiana, one of the top problems that Louisiana is gonna face going forward and it touches all aspects of our life. And as you can see, without action, further warming is all but assured at this point. So we need strong action uh, that begins not yesterday or not tomorrow, but, but, but today, but now. So uh, Aaron, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so what are we doing in this committee? So uh, Council President Moreno decided that this committee should not just focus on regulatory efforts that we've already uh, made significant progress with uh, with Entergy New Orleans. For example, as you me mentioned, uh, the Gulf South's first and one of the nation's leading renewable portfolio standards that will end the carbon emissions from electricity generation by 2050, which is uh, one of the fastest uh, pathways in the country and significant because it's the only one in the South. Uh, but in, in addition to that, we've also worked to create um, new opportunities for renewable development here in New Orleans, including creating a community solar program, including adding almost 100 megawatts of grid scale renewables to Entergy's portfolio through regulatory actions, which of course uh, help clean the uh, power that serves uh, everybody here in New Orleans, not just the government. So today, um, as mentioned, we're gonna start um, a uh, package of legislation. Uh, the first two initiatives uh, dealing with both vehicles uh, cleaning the city's fleet up. Um, so uh, the federal government has decreed that all federal um, uh, vehicles will be uh, zero emissions by 2030. We are moving uh, towards that direction as well, uh, hopefully with this ordinance's passage. Um, um, and then uh, we are also doing the same for the city's municipal power needs, creating opportunity for the city to immediately end carbon emissions from its uh, electricity usage. Uh, we're also doing some other stuff in this committee uh, that as well through the regulatory engagement, we're going to make some policy, we're going to do some of the dockets which we'll talk about that we've already started through utilities in the last term. We're going to do a ton of stakeholder engagement and capacity building. Uh, these efforts will not succeed without the community's impact and we need to have strong community engagement to make sure that everybody is served by these policies that these policies are equitable and they seek justice as well as climate action. And of course, we wanna to continue to raise awareness and create a whole of government effect on these issues. Uh, this is not just a council issue. This is not just a utilities committee issue. This is an issue that all of government and all uh, governmental sectors should be prioritizing. And we wanna help convene those conversations through this committee. Uh, next slide, Aaron. And for, for, uh, for clarity and simplicity, I'll just run through them so Aaron doesn't have to jump in and out. But uh, some of these dockets that we've already begun from the previous council, including the system resiliency and storm hardening docket that grew out of the effects of Hurricane Ida, which, it, which will by March create um, some opportunity for real stakeholder engagement and plans around building uh, a new generation of hardened grid for New Orleans um, and hopefully uh, utilizing federal dollars to make those costs affordable to us and really leap forward in protecting our uh, electricity grid. We're also gonna be working on the integrated resource plan, the IRP, which is the major planning document that plans generation into the future. Um, the ongoing IRP now, the 2021 IRP, has already uh, produced some really interesting findings um, showing that the renewable portfolio standard has done its work and the projections in the future are significant increases in renewable uh, generation acquisition for uh, Energy New Orleans, which will uh, significantly end our carbon emissions probably faster than we expected. Let's go to the last slide, Aaron. Hang on, Andrew, real quick. Let me go back sure. to that. To that sure. 
So I just want the council members to know uh, just the real importance around UD 2103, that particular docket, because this docket brings all stakeholders together, as Andrew talked about, um, as we, we look at what it's going to take to really harden New Orleans power grid. And this is going to be really impactful uh, as we work to draw down federal dollars because the federal government is really looking for that collaborative approach to projects. And so around um, this particular docket, we have Entergy, we have the city council, we have intervening stakeholders, we have different advocacy groups all weighing in on what they think a, a, a future hardened grid for New Orleans looks like. And we're not just talking about, you know, the, the strengthening of the, the, the poles and wires within the city of New Orleans, but we're also taking a look at how we move forward with microgrids and other types of climate initiatives. Like what, what does it all look like? So I just wanted to make sure that, that, that we all understood the importance of this particular docket because it's going to show that here in New Orleans, we have a plan for moving forward with a, 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 a better um, power grid and stronger power grid. And as we put this plan together, we brought all stakeholders to the table and that there is consensus around this plan by all, stakeholder, all stakeholders. And that's going to, at the end of the day, hopefully, uh, put us at, at, at the top of the list as far as, as receiving federal dollars. Sorry, Andrew, just wanted to make sure that, that everyone understood that. Absolutely, Council Member. That's an extremely important docket, and that'll be a docket that will, uh, I think, will make great changes, um, especially in uh, every in folks' lives in here in New Orleans, making sure that our power stays on even after serious uh, tropical events. So, thank you. Aaron, you can go ahead to the last slide. So last slide, uh, in the, these are some of these other dockets that are extremely important. I mentioned, I think two of these, the Renewal, Renewable and Clean Portfolio Standard. Um, this, uh, for council members who are just joining us, what's important about this is there is an, uh, there's an annual checkup on this. So it's not just about setting a standard, but also making sure that Entry New Orleans is complying with that standard. Um, so the council has a huge role here to play to ensure uh, that the, that standard is being held and we're, we're on the right path. Um, uh, and then the, the last one I didn't mention here is uh, uh, Council Member Moreno had uh, initiated a, a docket on electric vehicle adoption, um, uh, cleaning the transportation sector, electrifying the transportation sector. And that means public transportation, for instance, whether it's RTA or, or, or the city or in the case of uh, average folks who wanna uh, have a cleaner vehicle, we're gonna need an infrastructure to build um, to make sure people can charge their cars or uh, that they can uh, travel the same way they do today. Uh, it's already, a, the technology is available, but we need to build the infrastructure. And so uh, Councilman Moreno had commissioned a report uh, that gave us uh, some really good uh, guidance on, on, uh, on some of the future investments we need to make. And that grew into uh, work we did in the rate case, which, um, as the council member indicated, uh, has now directed Entergy to uh, build out uh, a sort of a first tranche of uh, level two electric vehicle charges here in New Orleans uh, at public sites. So at Nord facilities, at libraries and other uh, playgrounds, other facilities um, that will have electric vehicle chargers now available for the public. So that's going to be um, implemented. It's coming online this uh, quarter. And so I think people start to see street side effects of some of this work on electric vehicles. And we're just trying to move that work forward today into sort of at the next level. Again, we mentioned the community solar uh, docket. Um, and I, I'm, I think I'm proud that we've worked on that as well, which really gives access to renewable power for apartment dwellers, for people who, for, uh, people who can't afford to put solar panels on their roof, but can get access to community solar, which does cut their bills, but also creates real climate uh, action. And so that's really important too. So with that, I'm gonna, I tried to keep it uh, brief, but I'm gonna turn it over if there's any questions from council members. I'm, at, I'm sure Aaron or I can try to uh, answer those, uh, but for now I'd like to please turn it over to our other presenters who are graciously uh, waiting. Any questions from council members for Andrew or, or for Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Council member Thomas. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, several times the ability to track or to access federal dollars. Uh, now, is that, is that just for 
an overall net zero emissions policy because we're kind of tracking the Biden administration 2040, 2050 initiative, or is it project specific? Because uh, the MISI has basically said that there's about $158 billion uh, available worth of incentives, especially in subsidies, if you're putting forward initiatives to begin to deal with that net zero and sustainability. Uh, how soon or when do we begin to identify projects uh, or initiatives so we can begin to lobby or draw down for this money uh, as soon as possible? And, and also, uh, the federal government has a tracking initiative which gets it to a certain 65% by 30, you know, what is our tracking advice locally so that we can kind of know that we're not just putting forth policy, but we're actually heading in the right direction? I, I mean, I would just say, uh, and I, I'm happy to take, Aaron, if you have any, please add if you do. But uh, council member, this administration, the Biden administration, is the most climate focused administration in the nation's history. And if there is climate attached to a project, then it's being fast tracked. And so, uh, first of all, to your point about uh, projects, the storm uh, hardening and system resiliency docket, that's uh, 2103, March 1st, there will, uh, uh, stakeholders, energy, all folks are going to put forward actual plans that identify projects that are in line to be funded. And once that docket um, ends when we decide on those projects through the process that council decides, helps decide on those projects. The uh, federal funding we expect from the BIF bill that passed uh, last fall will start to be available in the summer. And so we'll be, we'll be basically shovel ready for projects like that, like you mentioned, council member, uh, right, right on time. So we'll have a, a great list of work that can be done that should be eligible for federal uh, funding that all that billions of dollars of federal funding that's now available for this specific work will be right in line and right ready to go by the summer uh, as that federal funding becomes available. And then obviously the next step would be, you know, as you mentioned, uh, appealing to the federal government, our elected officials in Washington, obviously our friends in the White House, as many as we can to make sure that New Orleans gets not just its fair share, but an inordinate share, hopefully, of uh, work here to make sure that we are as safe as possible. Now, these projects are specific uh, to the our relationship with energy and 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 the, the grid, which our council president explained. But a lot of these initiatives and groups uh, like Sankofa, uh, the Alliance, uh, uh, Dr. Wright, uh, uh, and her group, uh, they've identified initiatives and community-related projects that could potentially also qualify. How do we bring them to the table on the front end uh, to make sure while these big, uh, these government or these joint venture projects that we're participating in, that they're also in line for funding too? Well, I think one of the things that is, is great about our stakeholder process on the council level is, as you mentioned, the Alliance and some of the groups from Gulf South as well are almost always participants in those, in those conversations. Okay. And they'll bring forward, I'm, I'm sure on, in March, a great list of stuff that they're interested in working on and, and new ways um, for us to help engage the community. I mean, the council member, uh, uh, Council Member Moreno has always been very focused on making sure that the community has is not not just uh, at the table, but really bought in to the work we're doing on climate, and, because it's important that we have a mandate for people who really to make this action happen. So you're exactly right, Council Member Thomas. We're going to have the stakeholder process right now that's going on right now and more, obviously, because there are many ways in which through this committee, I hope, um, we work government wide on climate initiatives that come from the feds that don't have to do with, you know, our electricity grid per se, but might have to do with, for example, making solar plus storage uh, something that we do on all community buildings or, you know, churches and, and, and other facilities. These are things that communities really want to see and don't necessarily involve the government's stuff. It involves community assets. Right. So I think it's absolutely critical that the work of this climate work not just happen at the governmental and the sort of the corporate yeah. level but happen at the, the street level well i mean I, i'm just so excited about this i think this is uh when you talk about progressive this equals the kinds of progress especially in and how we deal with 21st century management of our energy and the world's uh, uh resources and i think there 
sustainable models, green hydrogen, anthropocenic models, uh, that I think that's just the way to do business uh, in the future. So uh, thank you. But, but tracking, and then I'll, I'll be quiet and listen because I'm learning so much. But tracking, uh, how do we propose to do that? Councilmember Thomas, if I can, in addition to the work that our advisors are doing, part of CURA's expansion includes a policy analyst, as well as a legislative aide and a staff attorney who will help do just that, to track and ensure that we are establishing matrices and measurements by which to ensure that we're achieving these goals. So I, I hear you, and CURA, part of our staff build out is to focus on having that expertise in-house to make sure that we are properly tracking and reporting out our progress in these areas. Thank you. Any other questions? Council member, we have three public comments. Perfect. Let's go ahead and take those, Aaron. The first comment is from Susie Trenka. She says, thank you for introducing this much needed committee and for proposing the first steps on today's agenda. I'm writing to call attention to two important areas often neglected in discussions of climate action and sustainability in the US. One, public transit. We need to rethink traffic and create cities where cars are not the default. The public transit system in New Orleans is inadequate, to put it mildly. Major investment is needed to make alternative means of transport an attractive option for everybody, rather than an unattractive, op an unattractive one for those who can't afford cars. Number two waste reduction slash recycling. The amount of trash generated in this city is simply grotesque. We need to take steps to eliminate single use plastics and other toxic materials, open parentheses, plastic bags, single use plates, cups, cutlery, Mardi Gras throws, the list goes on. We also need much better waste management and recycling programs, open parentheses, composting services, mandatory recycling for businesses, restaurants, citywide glass recycling, et cetera. I hope that these issues will appear on the agenda for future committee meetings. Thank you. The second public comment is from Courtney Nicholson, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Entergy New Orleans. She says, Entergy was the first electric utility in the country to commit to voluntarily stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions. Since then, we have set stricter reduction targets, a reduction of our emission intensity by 50%, from our year 2000 level and achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Our environmental strategy and initiatives are aligned with the United Nations sustainable development goals of ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all and making cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. We are excited to participate in this important initiative that the council is undertaking. The third comment is from Justin Schmidt, representing himself. Dear committee members and the newly elected council members, welcome to the show that never ends. Given the charge of this committee, I think it is the most appropriate venue to announce my renewal efforts to get to the bottom of the 1914 Edward Wisner Donation Trust and the many legal and ethical issues surrounding it. In January 2020, council members Moreno and Palmer first brought these issues to public light, but unfortunately by July 2020 for some unknown and undisclosed reason, they chose not to further pursue the issue. As Edward Wisner was the father of reclamation, it is appropriate to announce these renewed efforts at today's committee meeting. I look forward to working with all of you in the upcoming months. Perhaps Councilmember Moreno can fill you in on the history. Best, Justin Schmidt. Councilmember, those are all the comments on this matter. Thank you, Aaron. appreciate it. Uh, and then uh, just for, for those watching, if you see some glitches over here, we're having a smidgen of uh, technical issues, but that's just how it goes with Zoom these days. So um, I apologize in advance for that. Um, thank you so much, Andrew and Aaron, for that presentation. Uh, you know, you all just have done just such a fantastic job really building up this, this Cura office. And Aaron, I'm just so proud of the work that you've accomplished. And now with this new committee coming online, um, just very appreciative of your commitment uh, to this type of policy work and uh, you know really adhering to the council members wishes that this is our priority and, and you're really moving the ball forward for us thank you okay so now moving on to our agenda item number three this is an electric vehicle presentation that also goes along with uh, our clean fleet ordinance so 
The agenda item reads, the committee will receive presentations on the benefits of investing in electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. We have a, a couple of presenters with us. We have Tom Hazley with Louisiana Clean Fuels and RPC. And we also have Justin Ackley, Public Policy and Regulatory Manager for ChargePoint. And who would like to go first? It looks like we're going to take um, Mr. Hazley first. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you all for having me. I'm happy to be here at your first meeting. Um, we can go ahead and, and uh, move on to the uh, next slide. So today I'd like to briefly discuss um, some of the benefits of converting to electric vehicles for your fleet, but also uh, talk about some of the things that we see uh, moving forward here at the RPC. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with the Regional Planning Commission, we represent the eight parishes of the New Orleans metropolitan region, uh, which covers 1.3 million people. Uh, we are the designated metropolitan planning organization for our region, which means that we are responsible in large part for programming um, much of the federal transportation dollars that come to our region. We are also the designated economic development district, uh, which serves a similar purpose for federal uh, economic development funds. We also operate a substantial environmental program. We are the designated Louisiana watershed initiative fiscal agent uh, for LWI region eight. We run a brownfields program and we also run an air quality program, which is what I'll be talking about today. Uh, and then, of course, we also have a large uh, data and GIS component to our operations, and we serve all eight parishes in that capacity. So here at the RPC, we house the Louis Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuels Partnership, which is a Department of Energy designated Clean Cities Coalition that was established in 2008. Um, and under that uh, role, we have for many years promoted pro promoted the adoption of alternative fuels. Uh, that role has changed quite a bit over the years from basic education and outreach and now to actual implementation um, of infrastructure and vehicles. Uh, so what we do is we help identify funding for private and public organizations. We share resources. We do a lot of analysis on emissions and fuel usage. And uh, again, we do uh, quite a bit of outreach to the public, but also to private fleets and to government organizations. So uh, again, I wanted to go over some of the, the basic benefits of fleet electrification. Uh, there are many, many benefits, but I wanted to focus on just a few for, for the purposes of this committee and to be respectful of your time. One of the first that uh, comes up uh, quite frequently is reduced fuel and maintenance cost. Uh, so these figures are from the Department of Energy's 2020 alternative fuel price report. Um, and as you can see, converting to all electric vehicles has about uh, or less than half the cost per 100 miles driven uh, when you factor in fuel and maintenance costs. Uh, so that uh, goes down even if just switching to a hybrid engine. Um, but even more when switch, switching to all electric, we're about $2.40 per 100 miles driven as compared to $5.96 uh, per 100 miles driven under a gasoline engine. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see again, one of the, the most important reasons that we would consider switching to electric vehicles for our fleets is, that, is the uh, reduced emissions, particularly for greenhouse gases. All electric vehicles, produce about one third of the CO2 emissions of conventional vehicles uh, and even plug-in hybrids produce about one half of the CO2 emissions. And that's accounting even for um, the, the emissions created through the generation of electricity. Um, so these are national figures, again, provided by the Department of Energy. Um, so that includes all types of electric uh, generation. If we switch to more renewable energy sources, as was discussed earlier, uh, these figures would uh, be even better in terms of reducing uh, emissions. So those are national figures produced by the Department of Energy, but I wanted to show you some figures that we track here um, regionally uh, as part of our work in the Clean Fuels Partnership. Um, so this just in 2020 alone, when we look at the gasoline equivalents reduced uh, by switching to electric, plug-in hybrid, and hybrid vehicles. Um, our region, the eight parish region, 
uh, reduced about 364,000 gallons of gasoline equivalent. <clears throat> um, and that also, uh, that also resulted in the reduction of about 2,300 tons of GHG reduced. Um, so that's, uh, that's just in 2020. And as we know, people drove less in 2020. Um, if you look down at these charts here, these are our tracking of all alternative fuel uh, usage. Um, so in 2020, again, um, we reduced about 2 million gallons of uh, gasoline equivalent and electric vehicles accounted for about 17% of that. Um, and they accounted for more than 50% of the GHG reduced in 2020. Um, I'd also like to point out that these figures uh, are tracked by the RPC and they generally, generally reflect only fleet vehicles uh, for private and public fleets. Uh, these do not include figures from conversion of, uh, of actual private citizens driving electric and hybrid vehicles. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I wanted to point out some of our, um, some of our, excuse me. <laughs> I wanted to point out some of our, um, our, our highlights from 2020 from some of the fleets that we track. Um, on the left side, you'll see some of the largest, larger fleets of Coca-Cola bottling, which has eight hybrid heavy duty vehicles and the RTA, which has uh, 15 hybrid buses. Um, they're, they're reducing um, you know, thousands of, G, uh, of, of gallons of fuel and, uh, and, and several hundred tons of greenhouse gases on their own through their larger fleets. But on the right side, you'll see some of the smaller fleet conversions that we're working with, such as the Port of New Orleans, uh, which has two all electric vehicles and two plug-in hybrids and St. Bernard Parish, which has one currently all electric uh, vehicle, although I think they're, uh, they're ramping up. But even on, on just the smaller fleet conversion side, um, you're seeing some pretty substantial reductions in gasoline gallon equivalents and uh, GHG. So, so uh, I guess my, my point here is that you can have large reductions by a large scale fleet conversion, but also just, just switching over a few vehicles at a time can result in some pretty substantial benefits. So looking ahead in terms of what the RPC is seeing uh, for electrification of fleets uh, and, and for the public generally, um, we have produced a, the Southeast Louisiana Electric Vehicle Readiness Guide. So this is a guide that we've prepared primarily for local decision makers, uh, this committee in particular, uh, but also your counterparts in other parishes and cities. Uh, and this includes information specific to our region. It goes over the basics of electric vehicles and electric vehicle supply equipment, uh, what they are and how to convert. Uh, we consider in this guide uh, local demographic land use and travel data uh, so that you are prepared to not just, just, not just implement electric, vehicle, electric vehicles and their supply equipment, but also to do so equitably. Um, in this guide, we also go over some of the challenges and best practices that we've seen nationwide uh, and make some recommendations for, for you to consider as you go through this process. Uh, we've also developed a companion mapping tool um, that you can use to look at uh, where there are charging stations, cur stations currently, but also overlay, overlay that with things like demographic data, energy cost burden, uh, which is, of course, important when we're considering equitable distribution of charging stations and a number of other items that will, will be of use to you as you consider the locations for new charging infrastructure. Um, both the guide and the mapping tool are available on the RPC website. Uh, if you just go to norpc.org and navigate to our environmental section, you should be able to find both of those. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, I want to first of all point out that uh, as we're, we're looking forward, this year will be, um, will be very important as we develop policies and programs. And the RPC uh, will remain a resource for all of you. Uh, we are happy to provide information. We're happy to, to identify opportunities. 
Um, we will be developing a, an EV readiness roundtable as a follow-up to our EV readiness guide. Uh, so we will be inviting um, participants from all across the region in both the public and private sector to help guide our internal operations and policies, but also to share information uh, and to share best practices um, about, about uh, adopting EVs. Um, we know that there are already a number of federal grants and incentives for EV adoption and for infrastructure development. We've helped a number of our local partners here either purchase vehicles or get infrastructure installed. Uh, for example, uh, we have helped the Port of New Orleans and, uh, and the RTA and St. Bernard Parish purchase electric vehicles. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on all of those and we're happy to help you work through that process. But of course, one of the most important things we're tracking right now is the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and of course, that was brought up earlier. I wanted to point out a few things in the law that we are tracking here at the RPC that we believe will be directly involved with. Uh, the first are the grants for charging and fueling infrastructure for corridors and communities. That is a $2.5 billion program. Uh, that will be spread out over five years. And those are discretionary funds that the city would be eligible to apply for directly. The RPC would also be eligible to apply for directly. Uh, and this is largely to install electric vehicle charging stations. Um, these 50% must go towards uh, alternative fuel, fuel corridors, which in our state is essentially the interstates right now. Uh, and the other 50% must go towards communities. Um, so we are tracking that program. There is also a national electric vehicle formula program, um, which is not discretionary uh, being a formula program and that's $5 billion over five years. Uh, that will be directed by state deployment plans. Uh, those will, that plan will be created by DOTD. So we are beginning conversations with DOTD on how they are going about that process we will be in the room to help uh, develop that plan. And, um, <clears throat> and we also know that our other, our counterpart in Baton Rouge, the Louisiana Clean Fuels Partnership, which does similar work to us uh, for the rest of the state, will also uh, be working directly with DOTD on that deployment plan for how they'll, how they will uh, spend that money in our state. There are also a number of changes to existing programs for alternative fuels. Uh, and by that, I mean, these grant programs for charging infrastructure are entirely new pots of money. There are many other existing pots of money which have been changed to allow for greater flexibility in funding alternative fuels projects. Uh, for example, the congestion mitigation and air quality program has been around for many years. Uh, it is a program intended to reduce emissions in large cities. Um, we know that that program will be altered to allow for greater use of alternative fuels. And then, <clears throat> and then there are a number of programs that are uh, sector specific uh, that will allow for, for fleets to convert in sectors such as ports, in public transit, for school buses. So we're tracking all those programs as well. Um, and I think one of the most important things about everything related to the bill is uh, we're, gonna, we're, go we're going to be getting additional guidance throughout 2022. Uh, the bill was obviously passed, it is law, but the specifics of many of these grant programs, we are still waiting to see how they'll function for us here at the RPC. And then from that, how we can uh, help the city uh, implement many of these programs and get some of those federal dollars. Um, so I know I've been very brief and, and quick here, but I did wanna open it up to questions. Um, if, if anyone on the committee has, has questions for us. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. This was very helpful and um, good information for the council to have. Uh, on one of your slides, when you talked about local successes in 2020, you made a mention about uh, how even, you know, just a, a couple of, of vehicles, transitioning a couple of vehicles makes uh, a difference. And uh, here in New Orleans, you know, we're really hoping to transition a lot of the, the smaller vehicles. Um, it, are we able to move much faster in this because it appears now that the federal government and even the state um, through contracting with either the state or the federal government to, to get vehicles that 
that both um, both the feds and the state are now providing hybrid options for for gover for local governments as well. Yes, um, yes, it's, it's my understanding that the state now has uh, hybrid and electric vehicles under their procurement. Um, we at the RPC just purchased a new vehicle and we were we decided not to get electric because we don't yet have a charger, but we are getting one soon. So at the RPC, we anticipate being able to get a, an electric vehicle in the near future because of that reason. It will, make, it, will make, it will make it much easier for us to purchase electric vehicles. Yeah, and then from what I understand too, that um, on the federal side, there's many options for, for hybrid uh, as well, um, should the city decide to contract that route. Um, yes. Obviously the key piece though, is deployment of the infrastructure so that you know we ensure that there's enough, enough charging opportunities for, for our vehicles. And so that's why it's so important that we had already started with you know the rate case and things like that here in New Orleans to make sure that we have that infrastructure in place. Uh, as we move forward with important items like uh, the clean fleet ordinance that we'll be uh, talking about in just a bit. Let me open it up to the rest of the council members with any questions. Council member Harris. Yes, Madam President, thank you, Tom, for that um, presentation. I know we talked about corporate and governmental vehicles. Can you just talk a little bit about incentives for individuals mm -hmm. um, that you have identified for the people who are watching who may be interested in electric vehicles or greening the vehicles, but don't know where to start. Absolutely, that, and that's a, a very important issue. One of the challenges with electric vehicle conversion, uh, especially for the general public, is the cost of vehicles themselves. Uh, a new vehicle is a major cost for anyone, but electric vehicles remain um, more expensive than a traditional gasoline vehicle still. Uh, we anticipate, number one, that that will change as the market changes, uh, so the, the cost will go down. There are federal tax incentives uh, for the purchase of electric vehicles right now um, that uh, people who purchase a new electric vehicle can get tax credits, um, refundable tax credits. Uh, there are also incentives for installation of charging stations at residences. Uh, Entergy operates an incentive program wherein uh, they, will, they will rebate, give you a rebate uh, if you install chargers at your home. Um, now that does leave out renters and people in multifamily dwellings. The new programs uh, under the bill specifically address those issues. And in fact, they uh, require that as cities, MPOs, and states develop their deployment plans and apply for these grants, uh, they consider uh, areas of high population density, areas of high multifamily housing, um, and uh, areas with high renters. Council Member Thomas. Uh, well, fortunately, I made a great presentation, man. I'm, I'm so excited about uh, this committee, even with all of our other challenges, man. This is just wonderful to be part of uh, this effort, effort to bring our city in line. Uh, we know historically uh, from uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution to 5G, uh, uh, Appalachia and urban communities, even though we talk about inclusion, uh, they've been left out. There's a discussion about access to technology now, 5G. Folk, folk don't have 1G, and we're moving with 5G. Uh, how do we assure through zoning or identification of sites uh, that we make sure, especially with the Regional Planning Commission, because you guys are the best at that, how do we make sure that those communities in this region uh, are included? Yeah, that's a, that's a very tricky question. And I think one of the issues with something like zoning is um, opening up, uh, or rather, removing barriers to the, mm -hmm. the uh, implementation of some of this infrastructure. Um, and it could be simple as, as allowing the, the installation of chargers in public right of way, but also establishing uh, the standards for that, um, which is actually another thing that's included in the bill itself, but establishing those standards so that the infrastructure is not just there, but that it lasts, um, that you know we're, we're not just running sustainable. Miles. It's sustainable. Yes, it's sustainable, and then it's adaptable for future uh, for future technology innovations. Uh, I think that's a huge part of it, and it, it's it sounds like one of those simple things, but to to me, that's you know that's where the rubber hits the road is those kind of simple requirements and and removing the barriers, but also establishing the standards to make sure that's done correctly. Thank you. Thank you. 
And, and Mr. Hazley, I'll just mention this, um, and also to Council Member Thomas. Um, during one of our recent uh, reports uh, through one of the legislative items uh, at the Utilities Committee, uh, we do have a report with recommendations on um, some zoning suggestions and options so that there is equitable deployment of um, infrastructure. But so I want to, can we make sure that all the council members get the report um, so that we can, we can start looking through some of those zoning options as well. Good point. And I'd also encourage you to look at our uh, EV guide that we've just published. Uh, it does go over some of those issues more specifically. Great. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Hazley? Thank you so much. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you all. And now let's go to our uh, next presentation with uh, Mr. Justin Ackley with ChargePoint. Uh, good morning, Council good President morning. Moreno and Council members. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I, I do want to start off by uh, apologizing briefly. I have a 1045 uh, hard stop. The beautiful thing about technology is it allows me to be here, but it also requires me to be elsewhere uh, at, at a similar time. So uh, I'm going to run through my presentation rather quickly. Um, we, we would like to view this as a, a, an opening introduction to what ChargePoint brings to the infrastructure uh, conversation and electric vehicle conversation. And as this committee continues to evolve and work through these processes, we very much appreciate the opportunity to continue to be a part of it. So we, we thank you for the opportunity today. Um, ne next slide, please. So what, what we're interested in talking about basically today is we wanna talk about growth and, and mostly growth in the fleet sector. Uh, as we move forward in, in the electric vehicle sector at large, the opportunities that exist now are not gonna be the same opportunities that exist three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. There's gonna be enormous opportunities to continue to advance this sector and, and this opportunity or, or these, uh, these vehicles and infrastructure at, as the sector continues to grow from the, the kind of nascency that it's in today to a, a full blown transportation revolution. So uh, next, next slide, please, Ms. Spears. So this is a, just kind of uh, what we're gonna start off on the local level kind of at home and then we'll move a little bit further in to the fleet electrification. This is a little bit about charge point. You know, we see enormous growth in the sector. Um, these are kind of conservative numbers by 2025 and we see potentially a 30% saturation of the market by 2030. So we're, we're extremely optimistic about the electric mobility of the future whether it be uh, personal vehicles, fleet vehicles, or, or, or long haul trucking. So it, it, the growth opportunity that I, that I mentioned earlier is, is uh, fantastic and we look forward to being a part of it. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little bit about ChargePoint. Um, we are the largest manufacturer and participant in the electric uh, infrastructure sector. We um, compete in all, all uh, three phases of, of the fueling network. First being <clears throat> software. So we, we um, compose and, and distribute the uh, app, the ChargePoint app, which permits the EV driver to identify the infrastructure necessary to charge in the wild, as we would say. Most charging will take place at home on the personal vehicle side. But what, it, what this permits is for those who are out in the community to identify where the charging stations are located and how they are and how they're able to access them, how they're able to pay for them and manage the charge. Uh, we also manufacture the charging stations, and we also offer O&M services on the, on the back end to ensure that they are sustainable, as the, as the council member uh, mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. This is uh, the opportunities that exist for businesses. Um, the opportunity to <clears throat> electrify is, is really something that in the long term is going to save a lot of money. Our friends at the Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuels they, they identified the, the ability to save gasoline, to, to save carbon emissions, but there's also <clears throat> less O&M on, on electric vehicles. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear anecdotal stories, but as the leader in the industry, we can, we can really attest to the fact that there's, there's less maintenance, there's less uh, operational costs. And over time, it, it really offers businesses the opportunity to, to recognize those cost savings and achieve other things uh, such as benefits for employees, achieving ESG goals, and meeting government mandates, which was mentioned a little bit prior to this. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> this, is, 
this is again kind of how we see things playing out there there'll be kind of two sectors one will be personal vehicles for those that charge at home and and um, occasionally around town and then also for work vehicles and government vehicles that have the uh, the fleet capabilities these are these are really two different sectors as we see them but there is some crossover as as we get into uh, first, you've got the level twos at home, but or level ones at home, level two charging kind of crosses over. Then you get into similar things where you have DC fast charging, which is really for fleet and long haul applications. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And, and this is really you know the software that that really drives everything behind it. No pun intended. Uh, we have the data analytics to understand how EV drivers and charging apparatus work. And more importantly, we have the roaming capabilities and, and network agreements with our, our competitors to ensure that everything works seamlessly for the EV driver. What we don't want for whether they be residential or fleet clients to really struggle and have a bad uh, experience in the EV charging world. And then that kind of spirals out of control into word of mouth and, and really uh, struggling in implementation of the, of the whole thing. So what we wanna do is create a seamless opportunity for businesses and drivers to move forward. And then this is our comprehensive portfolio of everything that I mentioned before. We have the software, the hardware, and obviously the O&M services that go along with it. So um, it, you're welcome to dive into this a little bit further. In, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on. And this is where we see kind of the two things playing out for, for Louisiana and New Orleans in particular is growth. And on both sides of the coin, there are benefits and there are barriers. So this is just kind of overall how things are classified as types of fleet vehicles. This is from uh, the Department of Energy and just kind of some rudimentary facts of 12 million, uh, 12 million vehicles traveling 300 billion miles and consuming 400 or 45 billion gallons of fuel every year. Uh, so what we're discussing when we're discussing fleet vehicles is essentially class two, class two B, which would be kind of a full size cargo van pickup all the way down through the, the class eight, which is the long haul truck, the, the kind of heavier duty vehicles that we see out there. Overall, very small percentage of vehicles on the road, yet disproportionately uh, result in fuel consumption and, and emissions. So this is the this is the growth that we identify in, in the sector. Uh, as you can see, there there was a small drop um, in 2020 as as most of the economy went through kind of a little bit of a reversion to the mean um, as the pandemic kind of went across the country. But what you see is on the on the left side of the screen there is just overall growth of zero emission commercial vehicles throughout the, the economy. And more importantly, uh, you know, oftentimes people discuss kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Uh, do, we, do we need more growth? Do we need more vehicles or do we need more infrastructure? Well, this is, we don't really view it that way. It's kind of a hamburger and a bun situation where you need both to really complete the meal. You see on the right side of the screen there, the number of models that will be available to individuals and businesses as we move forward um, that's really going to give people the opportunity to find the vehicle that meets their needs and, and satisfies the demand of their businesses. And that's, that's where we see great growth opportunity and fleet electrification. Next, next slide, please, Ms. Pierce. So these are some of the benefits that we see available to the shift for fleet electrification, uh, fuel maintenance and cost savings, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Mr. Hazley also talked about the ability to lower emissions, uh, you know, on a much larger scale, there, there's the opportunity to promote energy security. Louisiana is no stranger to uh, energy production. So there, it's something that should ring home pretty true in the state of Louisiana. Um, there's cost advantages, there's new job opportunities. There's the ability to have fairness in envir environmental justice communities so that uh, oftentimes environmental justice communities are located in and around places where fleet electrification or vehicle electrification will promote a cleaner environment for them. And there's a better opportunity to improve work atmospheres for fleet drivers. So oftentimes they're not sitting idling and, and, and wasting fuel and opportunity uh, uh, while they're kind of waiting to circumvent that last mile. So that, that's some of the initial benefits. And then of course, there's always barriers. So we don't wanna paint a, a picture with rose colored glasses here. We wanna make sure that everybody understands that while the growth opportunities are also are great, there's also potential barriers to fleet electrification that we hope can be addressed both through uh, financial means of uh, through the government, but also through significant policy opportunities as well. Um, some of the potential uh, oper or barriers that you see there are upfront capital costs, uh, the expense of charging infrastructure through installation, operation, and maintenance. As I said, currently there is not a 
a, a model to meet every need. So the absence of, of models of medium and heavy duty electric vehicles. Uh, there are some technology challenges for battery weight versus payload capacity as, as battery capacity is influenced by everything from the weather to the weight. You, you also have to adjust uh, payload capacity and long haul ability um, based off of those technological challenges. And then there's also opportunities in the electric grid and, and utility rate reform. And I, I know the council has worked closely with uh, Energy New Orleans to work on some of those challenges as well. As was previously mentioned, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure fund is, is an opportunity to kind of resolve some of the upfront capital costs of the charging infrastructure. Uh, charge points currently working with DOTs across the country to try and implement and suggest best practices from all 50 states. You know, we look forward to working with Louisiana DOT and our friends at uh, Louisiana Clean Fuels to try and craft the best program possible um, and also bring as many uh, dollars to the state of Louisiana as possible. I think right now, Louisiana is slated to receive 73 million over the next five years from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Fund to kind of offset some of those costs that, that would um, ultimately be there in front of them. And then from a policy perspective, again, modernizing the grid and utility rate reform is something that can really uh, expedite the adoption of not only electric vehicle infrastructure, but electric vehicles as well. Um, my contact information is on the on the next page here. We're, we're happy to be a part of any conversation. We're happy to bring any ideas that we have from uh, other states and kind of best practices that we've identified from the last 14, 15 years that we've been in the sector and as a, as a leader in the sector. So if there's any questions that I can answer, I'm, ha I'm happy to. And again, look forward to working with the council as, as this committee moves forward. Mr. Ackley, you ended on a point that um, actually leads into the question that I had. You know, you really have your eye on kind of best practices happening all across uh, this country and, you know, which could potentially be uh, model cities for moving forward with electrification. So I'm never ashamed to try to borrow some good ideas from some other cities that we can bring right here to the city of New Orleans. So um, who who do you think is, is really, you know, kind of at the forefront of all of this, who we should take a look closely at, at, their, at the different policies and initiatives that they're moving forward? Well, I, I think the best way to answer that is probably uh, at a state level and within those state levels, you would identify probably the biggest cities that were there as they have the greatest need. Um, you know, we would classify California, New York, Florida, Illinois, Colorado, some of these states that, that have really been at the forefront of, of this policy debate and, and the electric vehicle sector debate. Um, they, they've really taken a lead. You know, not only do they have kind of policy foresight, but at the same time, they have buy-in from their stakeholders, which from the conversation I've heard today and, and just kind of background research is New Orleans has that from their stakeholders as well. Um, their utilities, the, the auto manufacturers and so forth to understand the challenges that um, New Orleans faces from a climate perspective. So uh, we, we would point towards those states and, and we're happy to bring more details to, to that conversation as, as you guys kind of formulate new ideas and, and wanna kind of think about what other folks have done to try and try and bring those to the city of New Orleans as well. That's something that we, we do with uh, many, many of our city and state partners across the country. Yeah, we would certainly welcome that that help. Um, you know, was looking at uh, talking about New York State, but in the in the city of New York, I was looking at how they transitioned roughly you know three thousand of, of their vehicles, um, their fleet uh, to uh, hybrid electric vehicles, and I, I believe they were able to reduce their emissions by about fifty percent over a period of three years, which is so significant. Um, yes, so absolutely. You know that that's a massive fleet that they were they were able to already um, transition. So you know we're certainly uh, I'll admit it we're behind, but we can catch up and we can catch up uh, quickly um, with the, with the team that that we have in place. I believe. Uh, question Absolutely. from from the council from Council Councilmember Thomas. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Ackley. Uh, I, I wasn't going to say anything till till that last last comment. Uh, the other thing those uh, other communities have different from us is uh, access to capital, money. Uh, you know, as wonderful as we are with our culture here uh, and our food, uh, we're not New York and Miami and LA and, and, and Chicago, and as, as rich as people think they're, they're here, they're not Dallas and Houston <laughs> and Miami rich. Uh, so what do you? what's your recommendation there, especially for uh, if I listen to some of my colleagues and my administration about the challenges 
uh, for money and capital, especially given some of our priorities here, how would you recommend that we do that to get to where we need to be here uh, with this issue? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's two opportunities that are presently before uh, the council. One is, as previously mentioned, the Biden administration committing significant federal dollars, and Louisiana should get their fair share of, of all of that. Being able to leverage that uh, with the private sector is usually how how we see best implementation and best practices across the country. <clears throat> While I think the bipartisan infrastructure fund um, offers up to 80% matching uh, or an 80-20 split, you know that that's not necessarily how every case is going to play out. There'll be a 50-50 split, a 60-40, any any kind of pairing that you can find there. So to really leverage those private sector dollars um, to to create a competitive marketplace for the infrastructure down there uh, in, in Louisiana is really kind of the best way that we've seen it done um, elsewhere. Uh, regardless of kind of where where it takes place, um, not everybody has unlimited funds, and and that's really kind of a commitment again from from the business community, from the, from the leaders and government to kind of pair together and really address the issues that you have. And from this conversation, it seems that everyone in New Orleans understands the challenges that New Orleans faces and it wants to address them. Any other questions? Council member, we have one public comment. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. I know that you're short on time. We appreciate you so much. Thank you all. We, we look forward to working with you. We do too. Thank you. Thank Go ahead, you. Aaron. The comment on this matter is from Dr. Myron Katz, representing himself and pro-rate energy building science and innovators and Greater New Orleans Interfaith Climate Council. His comment is, customer lowered electricity price, CLEP, has been introduced in two former dockets, 2015 ENO IRP and 2018 ENO rate case, and will be submitted again in UD 2103 on storm, hard, on storm hardening and grid resilience. No quality sustainability plan in New Orleans will work well without a quality rate design to support it. This is particularly true with EV, NEM, IRP, community solar, all of which are much harder to finance and support without a good rate design. Case in point, notice CA is currently fighting over NEM CLEP was invented specifically to enhance the economics of these technologies and work well with the $80 million spent on smart meters. If you want to supercharge the adoption of EV, give them the break they deserve to buy electricity at near wholesale cost at night and conversely be disincentivized to charge during near peak demand hours. That is the comment. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. Uh, members, I want to go ahead and actually take up the ordinance on clean fleet since it's related to obviously the presentations we just had. Uh, and so that is agenda item number five, ordinance calendar number 33592, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so, members, this is the, the clean fleet ordinance that mandates the end to purchasing fossil fuel passenger vehicles for non-public safety operations by 2025. But beginning in 2023, the city shall not purchase or lease passenger vehicles that do not meet EPA low greenhouse gas emission thresholds. Cities as diverse as St. Louis, Atlanta, Boston, and New York have all committed to municipal fleets with zero emission vehicles. So I do believe that it is doable in New Orleans. We certainly have our challenges and, and Council Member Thomas brought up the, the, the issue of, of capital, that's so true, but we must work toward this goal, particularly since the way that we have put this particular ordinance together, we're talking about our major small vehicle fleet. We are exempting public safety vehicles. Obtaining vehicles through the state, uh, which is what we currently do, uh, contracting with them, um, actually is an appropriate approach to this, considering that the state does offer hybrid vehicles. But we should also look at contracting with the federal government because they too offer even a wider selection of hybrid and electric vehicles. I also wanna mention that this call is not one to completely replace our fleet by 2025. It would just mean that moving forward from that point, any new 
purchased or leased vehicles by the city would need to comply with this particular ordinance. I'm happy to take any questions on this ordinance. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh, I think it's a really you know right approach that we need to be taking. And as you know, we're a bit behind, but we can catch up, and and that's the whole point of this. Any questions on this from council members? Council Member Harris. Madam President, uh, one question for my edification, probably the public's edification. Um, the city council and mayor are exempt um, from this, and I just wondered why. What was the purpose of that? They're not exempt. The way okay. that it, the way that it reads, I thought that too when I read this. So if, if we go, if everyone looks at the ordinance, we're talking about page one, um, line ten. That's where it starts on the exemptions. So this piece, uh, it talks about an exemption. In, in subpart A, but then when you look at section B, it says any vehicle in subpart uh, A shall be subject to section 2905. And then if you go to 2905, that is the, the, um, the actual elimination of fossil fuel powered vehicles. I too, council member Harris, I actually saw that and I was like, wait a second, what is, what, what, why? There's no way, why would we exempt ourselves? That makes no sense at all. So um, our executive council called me as to why it was written in that particular way and explained it to me, but no, we are not exempt. And so I appreciate you asking that question. Any other questions from any council members? Comments? No? Okay. Erin, any public comment on the actual ordinance? Yes, ma'am, we have okay. two. Go ahead. The first comment is from Deborah Lombard representing herself. The committee should consider an ordinance to transition the city fleet to zero emission vehicles only for newly acquired vehicles, not for vehicles already in properly working condition. Those need to be well maintained for most efficient exhaust effluent. From Ben Gordon representing Pax Christi USA in New Orleans slash Vets for Peace. Moving city vehicles away from dependence on fossil fuels. Another good move. Keep up the good work, Council. I got rid of my automobile in 1982 and bicycled or used RTA buses to my work at Charity Hospital for years. I hope the ordinance includes RTA city buses since I use them a lot with a senior pass using the front bicycle racks on rainy days. I gave up my... Oh. Yeah, that's the end of the comment. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Council Member Green is with us uh, now. I see him uh, logged on. Uh, okay, yeah, members. So, nice to see you or, or, or hear from you. Um, okay, so with that, members, I'd like to make a motion to for this committee to approve this ordinance and send it on to the full council. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, it is unanimous and it, it's going to the full council. Thank you, members. That brings us now to item four on our agenda, which is resolution R2211. And with that, I do want to bring up Andy Kowalczyk with 350.org. Uh, this is a, a global uh, advocate, a climate advocacy group. And Andy, it's so nice to see you again. You've done a lot of work with the council and uh, we look forward to your presentation. And your presentation is around uh, transferring uh, or, or ensuring that the, that the city facilities are powered with renewable power and the importance of moving in this direction. So Andy, I will turn it over to you. That's right. And, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I applaud this resolution on behalf of the council and it's the first step before the stakeholder process, which is really where all the fun starts. Uh, at least for folks that are clean energy advocates like myself. Uh, but, you know, I, I definitely encourage the public to participate in that stakeholder process. Um, it's where the law is kind of, is kind of discussed and made. Uh, but I, I just want to say that this is a very realistic, uh, yet very important step for the city. And this is an achievable goal to reach 100% renewable energy for municipal operations by 2025. Um, and I want to say, you know, very briefly, like I, I work uh, during the day as a consultant, uh, over 15 state footprint in the bulk electricity market. But climate action in New Orleans is very close to my heart because this is my adopted home. 
Um, and it's a very special place that is highly capable and ready for climate action. Um, and Aaron, if you wanna to go to the next uh, slide. This is a very broad overview, uh, this slide deck too. So I, I didn't wanna to get too far into the weeds. There's a lot of acronyms in this business. So uh, I didn't wanna kind of overwhelm people. Um, but you know, just to, to look over the landscape right now, uh, there are 40 plus cities that have decided to go clean municipal operations. Um, cities as large as Houston, uh, smaller cities like Arlington uh, in Virginia, and uh, Orlando as well, uh, just to the east of us. So this is not something that New Orleans is alone in. Um, and, you know, I want to say also that, you know, one thing that New Orleans has different than these cities is that it is a city that is, uh, you know, highly in, you know, aside from like Orlando and, and maybe even Houston as well, it is a city that's that's regularly in the spotlight during the uh, the hurricane season. So it's it's very important that leadership comes from those cities that are affected by climate change. Uh, go to the next slide. So going into it a little bit more, the reasons for city operations to go 100% renewable. Climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, I think everybody is fully aware that is on this uh, committee, um, are a threat to public safety and the health of cities. You know, there's air quality issues as well as just the order of society. We all saw how, you know, affected the citizens of New Orleans were by not having trash pickup for three weeks. You know, city, climate change is a very real thing. Um, and, you know, a shift to zero emission renewable resources is a solution that's affordable these days and relatively easy to deploy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This leadership is really vital from cities because, like I said, I work over a 15 state footprint, but cities are always the largest energy users in those states. You know, there are rural cities that use a lot less energy, but, you know, these, these metropolitan cities like New Orleans have a very big voice because there are very large energy users. Um, and the civic leadership from cities and city governments provides a clear and powerful statement about the imperative to act on climate change. Um, decarbonization, our, ah, sorry, decarbonization of electricity paves the way for decarbonization of everything else too that can be electrified. So it's very important to kind of get that loading order uh, correct. And um, that's not to say that we can't transition to electric vehicles right now, uh, but it will be a lot easier to reduce emissions overall if we electrify you know, our power usage, um, including sewage and water board, which is probably the, the largest municipal uh, electricity user, I believe. Um, in addition to these priorities, economic development also ranks amongst the reasons why city leaders want to establish 100% renewable energy goals. Um, I'll go into this on the next slide, but there are very large um, energy buyer uh, groups out there that consist of, you know, Fortune 500 companies and very well-known brands that have committed to 100% renewable energy. And they're doing this not only because of corporate sustainability goals, but also because this is good, cheap energy out there. Um, and there are market structures that support very affordable and very uh, amenable contracts for this renewable energy. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Aaron. So this is the, the big one out there uh, that um, was kind of referenced in the resolution itself. Uh, they just recently changed their name from Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance uh, to Clean Energy Buyers Alliance, but it's the same exact group. Um, I didn't count all of them, and I did link it in this presentation for the council members if you want to look at it later. Uh, they have a full listing of all the corporations that are um, members of SEBA. But basically, this is an organization of large consumer and industrial customers that are primarily focused on transitioning clean energy for their operations. Like I said, they're doing this because it's affordable and they're getting great contracts on this sort of thing. And they like having their own options. You know, they don't want to necessarily wait for utilities uh, to clean up their operations on their own. 
um, or for policy actors, uh, even for that, you know, in that respect. Um, they've recently announced a aspiration for 90% clean energy by 2030. Um, aspirations, not as strong of a word as legislation. Uh, I'll just point that out, but it is something that's uh, very notable and and something to applaud that there are corporations that are are you know taking the market into their own hands and pursuing clean energy goals. Um, there's a diverse membership, uh, everything from McDonald's to Capital One Bank, uh, Walmart. I think is a is a fairly well known corporation that uh, is has been pursuing sustainability goals. Um, Lowe's is on there. I don't think there's some people that probably aren't aware that Lowe's has renewable energy goals. But like I said, uh, linked in this presentation, uh, you can go straight to the About Us page of the SEBA uh, website and they'll show you like, I don't know, so over 100, I think, corporations that have renewable energy goals. Um, and I wanted to point out kind of the, the focus of my consulting work is with the Midcon and Independent System Operator, or MISO for short. And this is a 15 state footprint uh, regional grid operator and wholesale electricity market that kind of maintains a competitive market for electricity. And they do this through, you know, not only operational support of maintaining a balance on the grid and, and making sure that you know, our lights stay on over this 15 state footprint, but also through kind of their market design. And they have something called economic dispatch of power, where they choose the cheapest resources to run every day to fulfill energy demands. And what this does is as renewable energy prices go down, they are the cheapest resources to dispatch on the market. And so this is driven renewable energy goals as well as, you know, enabled a place for developers to uh, build these projects and give us great clean power. Uh, Aaron, if you wanna to go to the next uh, slide. So these are kind of the considerations for the docket. Um, these are just kind of my thoughts on it. There's a number of ways to, you know, kind of procure part, uh, uh, power on the market. Um, through different power purchase agreements or PPA for short. Um, what's common uh, with you know, a lot of these markets and with our renewable and clean portfolio standard, which is the mandate on energy to, to meet clean energy targets, um, is that they track these renewable energy goals through something called a renewable energy credit or certificate, I'm sorry. And these RECs are available on the market uh, they are something that can be bought unpaired with the electricity for energy. It's something that needs to be kind of retired uh, when they are tracking their renewable energy goals to kind of, you know, prove that for every rec, you know, it's one megawatt of energy. Um, so this is kind of like a certification of renewable energy, uh, uh, you know, when there's renewable energy created on the market and, and in real life. Um, so, you know, the other part of this is that it becomes a stream of revenue for developers as well. They get compensated for these recs. And when you have corporations that are not necessarily using this energy, um, they are still buying these recs to encourage renewable energy development as well as you know, to, uh, you know, certify that they are meeting their goals. Um, but what happens to that energy near like a solar farm or a wind farm is that that energy is picked up on the market and it can serve the goals of the council in this resolution uh, to reach 100% renewable energy. Um, and there are partnerships too, like uh, in the previous slide, it was showing uh, in Houston or Arlington, I believe, uh, teamed up with Amazon on a solar farm where they're getting the energy, but Amazon is getting the recs. Um, so some of these market designs uh, for power purchase agreements, um, one is a virtual power uh, purchase agreement, and that's kind of like what I just explained. Uh, the Venture Solar Project, which is a pretty large solar farm, uh, even for the United States, uh, it's 
you know, definitely large for Louisiana. Uh, but it's a 345 megawatt solar farm uh, in Point Coupe. And uh, they contract directly with a merchant generator, which is BP Light Source, uh, who built the project and who is kind of, you know, they're selling the power. And then the recs are sold to the corporate buyers, which is McDonald's and eBay. Uh, and then there's sleeved PPAs, uh, which kind of go through the utility and they kind of, the utility kind of takes on the market risk and also provides the, the complementary power to the renewables. Um, and then there's, you know, others that I, I put in here just for consideration that are uh, slightly different, but I think are, are worthy of um, including in the conversation, the stakeholders process. Um, that's all I have for slides. And um, oh, there's one more. That's right. So this is just to illustrate that uh, MISO is planning for a renewable energy future. Um, it's predominantly what is in the quote unquote queue to be interconnected to the grid. Uh, and it has been for the last five years. So they are learning what the challenges are gonna be in the coming years and what kind of grid improvements that they need to make. So kind of calling back to the grid hardening issue that was uh, mentioned earlier by council member Moreno. Um, and this is also to show that uh, there are other utilities and states that have ambitious uh, climate goals. Um, I shouldn't say ambitious, but I should say realistic uh, climate goals um, that uh, you know, are kind of connected to us through this uh, wholesale market. So you know, this is something that can help us get to our goals and um, do it reliably and affordably. And Andy, just stay on that slide real quick because, um, and I'm gonna try to put my little arrow here. The other thing we need to work on, and as, as Councilmember Morrell gets on LMS, um, is this connectivity between the North and the South. Um, Andy, you and I have been talking about this for quite some time. The couple of ties there are not sufficient. And so we just keep need to continue our advocacy around that um, so that we have more opportunities for the transfer of power uh, coming in from the North to the south, from the south to the north. Um, this is what needs to be uh, expanded and developed um, even more. And I know we <laughs> that's maybe a conversation that we'll have uh, at, at, at much larger length in, a, in, a, in another committee meeting because that's a topic on its own. But Andy, I wanted to thank you for your for your presentation and for your um, for your slideshow uh, as well. And you you know, you, you, you broke it down perfectly because. Uh, when I, initially I started uh, putting this legislative item out there, there was some confusion. You know, some were like, wait, Helena, are you trying to put solar panels on City Hall and every other building? And every, is, that what's, is that what you're trying to do as far as, you know, ensuring that, this, that city facilities are powered by renewable power? Well, I think that that's unrealistic to do that. But the way that we do accomplish it is by these power purchase agreements. And that's how the city of Houston was able to do it so swiftly uh, to accomplish it for, for all of their city operations. I mean, they're done. They're, 100, they're at 100 percent. And it's through these power purchase agreements. And so that's what I, that's why I think that we can move very quickly as far as our city facilities go. Uh, to create that power purchase agreement. Andy, you talked about a docket. You're right. We're probably going to need to move forward with a docket next should this particular resolution with our intent on this move forward today uh, or tomorrow during the, the council meeting. Um, so I think for the city facilities, it can move very quickly. Sewage and Water Board, they also purchased some of their power from Entergy. So I think that they can move forward with a power purchase agreement on renewable ener energy through Entergy as well swiftly. You know, they also generate their own power that's diesel and natural gas. So there would we would need to, you know, figure out what their path looks like as far as, 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 as that generation goes. Um, you know, I think it's going to obviously take more time and we need to be realistic about that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't start now, though, with some piece of it with a new type of purchase agreement with Entergy on the renewable power piece, at least. Uh, so those are just my quick comments on, on this topic. Are there any other, are there any questions or, or comments from council members for Andy? Okay, hearing none. Andy, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you again. Appreciate it. Okay, so then that'll bring us to uh, 
Go ahead. Oh, we you have, have public comment. comment. Oh, okay, yeah. go, ahead. go ahead. From Deborah Lombard. I applaud the city resolution encouraging the city and the sewage and water board to take steps toward utilizing 100% renewable power to meet their energy needs. However, the word encouraging should be replaced with requiring in order to meet the governor's executive order number JBE 20-18, section 2B greenhouse gas emissions per, per climate initiatives task force. Thank you, Deborah A. Lombard, EIT, LEED, AP. Ben Gordon. Rep representing PEC Christie USA in New Orleans slash Vets for Peace. I'm in favor of the Sewage and Water Board moving toward 100% renewable energy as soon as possible. Climate change is a serious issue to be taken seriously. We only have one global world, let's not blow it. And from Logan Burke. Council, thank you for taking this step to move the city of New Orleans, including Sewage and Water Board to 100% renewable energy. As many New Orleanians are aware, the city and especially our water system demands an extraordinary amount of energy, currently in both electricity and gas-fired self-generation. This resolution builds on the steps that the council has already taken in the development of a renewable and clean portfolio standard and even the Energy Smart Program and puts truly clean, renewable, and efficient energy as the prim primary goal. The Alliance encourages the city and this council to take this opportunity to find new ways to develop local renewable generation and renewable workforce. While the RCPS currently allows accounting for renewable energy certificates from far away generation, this step represents an opportunity to truly invest in New Orleans, whether through carving out our, or valuing locally sourced renewable generation or entering into virtual power purchase agreements with power generated right here. The next steps following this resolution will define how serious New Orleans is about these investments, or if accounting and offsets will be the central focus. The Sewage and Water Board's existing energy plan completed in spring of 2020 includes the installation of more new gas-fired turbines. We hope this resolution sparks an effort to find different solutions. While we, un while we understand this resolution is not a mandate, it is a signal that this council intends to support the city's efforts to lead on climate action in the region and we urge the various stakeholders listed here to collaborate in good faith. Those are all of the comments, council members. Thank you, Aaron. appreciate that. So um, as I mentioned with this resolution, this is, and, and Logan just said it very well too in her, in her uh, comment that she submitted, this is, that this is the first step. This is the first step toward a goal to power city and sewage and water board owned facilities with 100% renewable energy. We've mentioned other cities who've done this, Houston, Atlanta, Washington, DC, Orlando, uh, just to name a few who have either already 100% achieved this or are on the path to achieving this. And, you know, I have to say this, that Entergy New Orleans, uh, they're going to be a, a major part of this, an integral part of this. Conversations I've had with um, its CEO, uh, she is very uh, supportive and, and wanting to work with the council to get this accomplished and, and, and make this work for us. So appreciative of that as well. So if this resolution is adopted, we can move forward from that point and I'll take Aaron's counsel on this. Um, Aaron, if we need to start a docket, uh, you can just let me know what, whatever the next path forward should be. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Aaron, as, as the additional legislative items that, that will come. But this is the piece that starts it off by us saying, the city of New Orleans needs to move in this direction. So I ask for your favorable vote on this. Happy to take any questions for the resolution on the legislative item. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, all in favor then say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Okay, the resolution uh, is adopted in this committee and it moves forward to the full council. It looks like there are no additional items on the agenda. Is that right, Aaron? That's okay. it, council member. Okay, any other comments from the council members? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn then. It's been moved by council member Morell, seconded by council member Thomas. All in favor, aye. Aye. Hearing none opposed and we are adjourned. Thank you committee, great.